Right off the bat, if you didn't watch part one, I highly recommend going back and watching that before starting this video. It provides a lot of context for today's video and over information in regards to copyright laws in Japan. Technically speaking, this may not be a bad place to start as chronologically speaking, the Konami memory card scandal actually came first. This was the incident that would ultimately morph Konami into the company we all know, love, and respect today. Ha. Aside from neglecting and pimping out their franchises to pachinko machines. Which is kind of funny and ironic considering the fact that they set a copyright precedence in Japan in order to save the innocence of a character. And yeah, they also made one for Tokameki Memorial as well. Konami is also known for a blitzkrieg of suing rivals, former employees, and fandoms in general. True, it's an oversimplification, but basically anyone who Konami feels could potentially damage the company's reputation. Kind of like what I said earlier, the irony and hypocrisy is not lost on me. Regardless, Konami is kind of known for being gung-ho like that. So today we are gonna look at the catalyst that gave Konami the stones to bring lawsuits to anyone in the world who would choose to oppose them. All starting with a simple, unlicensed memory card company known as Spec Computer Corporation and their GameShark-like data on those cards. This was the time Konami fucked all fan projects. Or really, just got the balls to go after bootleggers, independent developers, fandoms, or just anyone, really. Part two. In Japan, Tokameki Memorial must have seriously been huge. Yep, the dating sim that helped popularize the genre is at the epicenter of this lawsuit as well. And what I think is even crazier is the fact that both of these lawsuits took place in the same year. Game Tech, which was a subsidiary of a larger firm known as Spec Computer Corporation, created a device known as the Exterminator. Simply put, the Exterminator was a hacked, unlicensed memory card that contained save data on it. Two variations of this card were created at the time. The one we are focusing on today specifically contained save data for Tokameki Memorial on the PS1, while the other contained the save data for other early PS1 titles. I gotta stress, this franchise was so huge that other companies wanted to capitalize on it by selling hacked memory cards with data from the game on it. These memory cards were sold under the promise that on the cards would be data that completely maximizes all the stats in the game, give the players access to all the game's endings, and unlock all the content in the gallery mode. So basically the equivalent would be an unlock everything cheat code from like a game shark, with the only difference being the data itself was already prepackaged with the card. And oh boy, Konami didn't like that. They disliked the thought of the game's data being prepackaged on the unlicensed card so much, they would begin filing the paperwork immediately to bring a copyright infringement suit upon the company, seeking damages. And yeah, you heard me right, they sued for copyright infringement. Which, the equivalent to that would be like if Nintendo decided to sue the company that made Game Genie. Which was an actual thing that happened. Japanese developers have always been super weird about their intellectual properties, not only in Japan, but in other parts of the world. I don't want to get too off topic here, but Nintendo has literally done everything from try to get video game rentals banned, seriously, to suing the creators of Game Genie for copyright infringement. However, where Nintendo failed in their earlier endeavors, Konami would find a staggering and a little scary amount of success. The court proceedings began with an argument by Konami, which thanks again to Gaming. MOE for highlighting this specific quote from the court documents. The essential quality of the right to preserve the integrity of a work as an author's moral personal right lies in the inviolability of the integrity of a work in its contents. When it is made available to the public for their utilization, it is to be distinguished from the essential quality of a copyright as a property right in that the latter forbids an unauthorized utilization of a work by a non-copyright holder. In considering a violation of the right to preserve the integrity of a work, therefore we have to review a whole series of processing of making the work available to the general public for their utilization and to inquire at what stage an act was done to impair the integrity of the work in its contents. Basically Konami's arguing the fact that because they were selling hacked game data that they were infringing upon their copyright for the IP. Even though they were not selling the game itself or anything like that, because it was save data hacked and given to the buyer, it infringed on their copyright. And this didn't just mean mean the selling of products, it also meant for personal consumption as well. Meaning the exact opposite as here in the US, where what you do with the product after you get it is pretty much up to you. This is simplified of course, however what Konami was implying here is that even tampering with the save data creates a derivative on their IP, and even if it is for personal consumption, it would be against their copyright. Hey, if there's any consolation from these Konami lawsuits, the fact that they argued that video games should be presented under the same copyright laws as like 
fine arts, movies, etc., etc., etc. So for those that are arguing that video games are art, well, you can point to the direction that there is legal proof that it exists. During the initial court case, Konami's attorneys thoroughly discussed what the game is, how it works, and that because the images and story itself evoke emotional responses from the player, that they would fall under the category of film, art, etc. And that by challenging the game's parameters for how it is played and how a player would ascertain a certain ending, the exterminator device infringes on their copyright. I won't be going over all of the case word for word, but we'll look at some of the highlights. I do have a full translated copy of the court case linked below though. Early on, Konami's arguments stated that by configuring with the parameters of the character, that it changes the way the character is utilized throughout the game, saying that. Now, at the outset, the hero as a starting high school student is credited with 100 in physical condition, 4 in letters, 40 in science, 40 in arts, 40 in sports, 32 in sunrise, 60 in figure, 5 in fight, and 0 in stress. This means that at the start of the game, the hero has no particular individuality, and that the way he will play the game has in it all latent possibilities of developing his individuality in whatever direction it may be. But the hero as a high school freshman is rated, for instance, at 999 in all the parameters except zero in stress by block one of the instant memory cards. It means that he is transformed into an extraordinary student. His scholarship for one is such from the first that he will sit totally unprepared for the first term and examination on July 10, 1995. And for all that, he will emerge at the top of the list. We need hardly point out that such a modification is so seriously damaging as to bring to naught all the efforts the individual designers of the instant game exerted in determining the hero's individuality as stated above. It's true. Instead of being a loser, I too would have been heartbroken if I instantly turned into a stud at the beginning of high school. The attorneys continued by breaking down how the parameters work more specifically in conjunction to obtaining the love and affection from the game's primary heroine, Shiori Fujisaki. To give a concrete illustration, the game is designed in such a way that the hero can win a confession of love from the lips of prime target Shiori Fujisaki when he has fulfilled the two requirements. A. That as to the nine open parameters, he get at least 130 in letters, science, art, and sports, 120 in sundries, and 100 in figure and fight. And B. That as as to the undisclosed parameters, he get at least 80 in hearts throbbing, at least 50 in friendliness, at most 50 in heartbreak, and at least 8 dates. Or you could just buy her a movie. But that's not right! Later on, Konami brought up how because of utilizing this pre-existing save data, individual events were being changed. Now, let us turn on to the modifications in the contents of the whole game software, attributable to the modification of the character figuration of the hero, and we find the following. Modifications visible to the eye. <laughs> so this quote's kind of hilarious to me because they don't really use verbiage like this for the rest of the court case. Uh, and it's kind of funny because it's almost like, oh yeah, we fucking got him right here. The instant game software is designed to make different girl students appear before the hero with the progress of the game in such a way that when, but not until, his respective parameters attain certain values, a girl student corresponding to such values appear on the screen to encounter him. For instance, take the case of girl student Mio Kisaragi. The player has a one-third probability of getting her on the screen by choosing the command for letters if his letters parameter is at 50 55 or more if acquainted with no girl, or at 75 or more if acquainted with one or more girls. In the instant game soft work, re required denominations of parameters vary with the girl student, so that by no contrivance whatever can he encounter more than three girl students before May of the first year. Thus, there is a certain latitude in game development originally allowed for changing quote unquote the time of the first student encounter with a girl student. Okay, I think you kind of get the gist on everything Konami argued here. Again, the whole case is linked below, but believe me when I say it's super weird reading about how game mechanics are ruined based on save data in a court of law. Honestly, I just find this so surreal that I'm reading legal documents that break down the mechanics of a dating sim game. Yeah, okay, this is Japan, but not everyone there plays video games. Or are weebs. Can you just imagine the look on some of these lawmakers' faces and then being all like, what the fuck? Then imagine later that year, you're a lawmaker and you see the same exact Konami reps step into the courthouse. However, this time they've brought evidence of infringement in the form of schoolgirl hentai. And it's from the same series whole fucking thing is crazy. And there is also one thing to keep in mind from this little diversion. Konami's crusade to protect the innocence of Tokimeki Memorial all started from what amounts to a stat boost in a video game. 
seriously. And for the most part, this is what the defense argued in their day in court, that they were not selling copies of the game, only the hardware with specific parameters on it that would give the players stat boosts. I'm oversimplifying, but it's basically anything you could get from like a game shark. In the end, it wasn't enough as Spec Computer was found to have been infringing on Konami's copyright and made to pay damages, setting a precedent in Japan in regards to game hardware manipulation and fair use practices. After losing the lawsuit in 1999, the defendants would attempt to get an appeal over the court's initial initial decision, but it was denied, citing that Konami had shown substantial evidence that the company had its copyright infringed upon. Spec Computer Corporation, the company would end up paying 1,146,000 yen with a 5% interest rate per annum from December 27, 1996 till the date of final payment. This 5% was actually something I forgot to mention in last week's video as well, so ouch, that's a lot of money. Money talks! <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Krabs. One interesting thing to note is that like the hentai, not that many copies were sold. Only around 522 copies of these memory cards were actually sold. The underground market in Japan is a strange one, and with so little copies of these things being sold, it painted Konami in the light that they were a sue happy company, willing to go after the fandoms of their properties. There's kind of a bizarro parallel when it comes to this case, as well as the Nintendo versus Game Genie one. In the Game Genie case, the court was worried that by labeling this as copyright infringement, it would potentially stifle creativity and innovation, while in Japan, it was ruled the exact opposite. Which is probably why Nintendo is still super salty today. However, another interesting note is the butterfly effect of these companies' lawsuits with companies like Nintendo. After seeing the success that Konami had against the various fandoms in Japan, independent doujin creators, etc., Nintendo took it upon themselves to have a famous Pokemon doujin creator arrested to make an example out of. I found this out reading the article on these incidents provided on gaming.moe. So seriously, check that article out. I'm not kidding about Nintendo either. They have a long history of some shady and legally questionable things and Trust me when I say they have plenty of skeletons in their closet, but that's for another time and I digress. There is another famous case where Konami sued the company Roxor over dancing pads. Fucking seriously. Which follows similar beats to this case, and I felt I should at least mention it here despite it not having really anything to do with the Tokameki Memorial case. It's pretty famous in its own right, so if you do enjoy these and want to see me cover it in a future topic, let me know in the comments below. After everything said and done, Spec Computer paid its fine and continued on, with the company still actually existing to this day. Even its subsidiary Game Tech still exists. They mainly focus on selling game peripheral hardware accessories. In the end, I didn't go over the entire litigation process, but it's still an interesting story when you're looking at copyrights and independence. Last week I made the claim that Konami fucked all fan projects, and I still stick by that. The effect of these two cases surrounding the infringement of Tokameki Memorial are literally still felt today. Just ask the developers of AM2R and Chrono Resurrection as an example. However, like last week, I gotta stress Konami did bring up some valid arguments in their claims. Yeah, it's cool and it's sexy to hate on Konami. Hell, I do it every chance that I get. But in all fairness, despite my personal feelings being the exact opposite of the outcome, Konami did actually have merit in some of the arguments they had. Boo! You stink! I'll postulate the same question as last week. Where do you stand on fan-produced content as well as independently produced content, and where should the line be drawn? Is data on a memory card really that harmful? If you did want my opinion, honestly, you'd still have to buy the game anyway, even if you wanted to see the endings. And let's be completely real about this. Memory card swapping has existed since the beginning of fucking memory cards. In the end though, it comes down to personal belief. Two different cases, two similar outcomes, and ultimately multiple precedents being set. Konami, Konami never changes. Make sure to keep things light and rebellious. I'll catch you guys in the next one.